study our service tonight. If you take turn to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 4, we're looking here. This is the message that I preached some time ago. It's nothing new, and it's even one that um, has been preached before. And so, this one that I think is good for us today. Every once in a while, we visit back to some topics that are still good for us to have. Uh, all of them are good. But every once in a while, we need to be reminded of some truth um, in our life. And here in Jonah, um, I've used this recently. I found myself using this story with several people recently. And so I thought this was something good for all of us to look at here about Jonah. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 9, it says that God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the Lord? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. For this plant that is risen up, that is giving him shade and die, and he gets mad. That said, it's a good to get angry even for this thing. He said, yes, even unto death. He was angry. Tonight we're looking about um, being enslaved by anger. Not just that we become angry sometimes, but Sometimes it can consume us if we're not careful. Sometimes it can cause us to do things or to say things we normally will not do or say. Sometimes it causes us to make decisions in our life that normally we would not make if we're not been so angry. And this anger can lead you to bitterness. It can lead us to stop serving the Lord. I want to see how this worked out in the life of Jonah. At this point in the story, we see Jonah's upset with what God had done. I mean, this is the work of God. And Jonah's man. Now look here in Jonah chapter 4, verse 4. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a book, and sat up under it in the shadow. So he might see what would become of the city. So now God has told them, if the city does not repent, if they don't turn, I'm going to destroy them. Jonah's like, good. <laughs> yeah, they need to be punished. Huh? And these people have come back to him, to his people. These people have told you to torture them. Jonah didn't want to go. You know the story of Jonah. He goes to the other way. The sea, the storm comes. In the boat that it's in, they think they want to die, then finally they throw him over, the well swallows him. Comes and spits him out on the ground, there he goes. So he goes to the preachers, and it's not happening. Find out what you want me to do, but it's not happening. So now, he's going to go out to this side of the city, and he's going to sit down to see if God's going to destroy it, or it's going to happen. Then he might see what will become of the city. He's not rejoicing that they've repented. He's not rejoicing that people are saved. He wants to see what's going to happen now. Verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a war and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head, to deliver him from his grief. So John was exceeding glad of the Lord. It's like this plant that grew up and it was providing shade from the heat. For some, but God prepared a warrant. When the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it put it. And it came to pass when the sun did rise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted, and wished himself to die, and, it's, and said, It was better for me to die than to live. Verse 9. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the poor? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. He said, Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the poor, for the which thou hast not labored, neither made the grow, which came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I stir in Nineveh, that great city? Look at that. He said, You feel sorry for the poor that it came up in the night with it. He did nothing for it. Now he compares that, he says, verse 11, Should not I spare men of that great city, where there are more than six, four thousand persons that cannot discern between the right hand and the left, and also left hand? So God says, You have compassion on the planet. Don't you think we should have compassion on all these people and even the animals here? Should 
The people of Nineveh are repented. God has forgiven the people. But Jonah's heart remains unchanged. He hated them before he came. But he had to. He preached the gospel. They repented. And afterward, he still hates them. He goes out of the city on the side of Jewachi. Maybe that was too soon. So hoping in his heart, maybe somehow, maybe there's some few that don't repent. Maybe God will change. I mean, the anger, the bitterness is there. That is not him. He seems to be more miserable now than he was in the belly of the whale. And in the belly of the whale, he's miserable. But now, I mean, now think about this. When John is in the belly of the whale, what's he doing? Oh God, this Savior. Oh God, this is for me. Uh, is that so? Yes. And the belly of the whale, he wants to be delivered. In the belly of the whale, he's promising God everything. No. He's out. People have been saved. Lives have been changed. Now he just wants to die. And so they even let him just die. No, he's worse off than before. And you think the lowest place you can get is in the belly of the whale, but now he's even lower now. Now he just wants to die. He's praying and asking God, just let him die. Before it's for deliverance, now it's for death. What a sad place to be. We're going to look here about this thing, buddy. Let's first of all look at the prison of self pity. Look at Jonah chapter 4 and verse 4. Jonah chapter 4 and verse 4. They said of the Lord, they said the Lord, Do us thou will to be angry. And God said to Jonah, in verse 9, look at verse 9. And God said to Jonah, Do us thou will to be angry for the Lord. And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Now, his anger turned into self pity. Feeling sorry for himself. Life's not fair. It's, it's just not fair. It's not how she be. Now he's feeling sorry for himself. It's so fair. God has been merciful to the people of Nineveh. He has forgiven them. But Jonah is still upset. Jonah is still mad. Now he has an attitude towards God because of what God has done. I mean, God, why should why could I, I mean, you're saying, why could I just die to the sea? I don't know, why did I have to do this one? And now he's feeling sorry. He reports that. The Bible says in the book of John, Verily, verily, I say to you, whosoever could have sin is a servant of sin. You know, when you have a wrong attitude towards God, you're not right with God. You're not well pleasing to God. When you're not willing to follow God's plan, when you start feeling sorry for yourself and thinking how difficult it is for you and how, oh, that's not the right place to be. Instead of rejoicing with the people of Nineveh, what God has done, John now separated himself from them, and these are now like his brothers and sisters, right? That's how we look at them today. We understand these people are right with God now. He should be rejoicing. He should have been with them. But it's not. Instead, he goes off by himself. And he's sitting down. Maybe God is sitting he's, he's looking to see what's going to happen to the city. God said, go to straight. That's not the right. That's not the right outcome. These people turn to God. There should be rejoicing. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 5, turn over to Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21, turn over to there. Here in your New Testament. I'm sorry, the Old Testament. Book of Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his wrongs. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and it shall be holding with the word of the courts of the sins. It says, so Jonah has a prison of self. He's bound himself to the courts of sin. God didn't do this to Jonah. The people of Nineveh at this time did nothing wrong to Jonah. I mean, the people of Nineveh, God, God, God's not Jonah. They don't know the right hand from the left. They know nothing about the before. Yes, they've 
system, they've done wrong, they made mistakes, but now they're right with me. Huh? You're not pitching on this plant on this board. Yet you can't have pity for these people. You just have pity for yourself. This self-pity. Now you're so good. Oh my God, it's not, life's not fair. Have you ever been there before? All of us have been there before. Don't mind me. <laughs> You've been there before, maybe when you're younger sometime. All of us have been there. The whole thing won't go back to that place. But at some time in your life, or maybe even now, you might be kind of more trouble this year. Feel sorry for yourself. Think it's not fair. Why do I have to be in this position? Why? Why? Self-pity leads to loneliness. Where's Jonah now? He's off by himself. Is that so? But he's inside the city, outside of town, by himself, standing there, wishing for them to die. And now thinking, well, if they're not going to die, maybe I will. This is the only Feel no sorry for himself. Self-pity leads to loneliness. In Romans chapter 6, look over there. Now, let me say this. Jonah chose to separate himself. Sometimes you still start feeling sorry for yourself. Well, these people are persecuted. These people don't like me. These people say something against me. This person made me do something I didn't want to do. That's Jonah. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. Now, feel sorry for yourself. Whatever the circumstance, it doesn't matter. When you get to this place where there's no self, that self-pity, sometimes you isolate yourself, and there's sometimes people draw themselves away from you because they don't want to be around that type of attitude. People feel sorry for themselves. I'm being persecuted. That's not the, the healthiest type of attitude that I have. All right? And the Bible says if we suffer for righteousness' sake, we should what? Rejoice. That we're kind of worthy to suffer for Christ. Not go on our own. Huh? With this look on our face, so that kind of, you know. Not going around and telling every person how you're being mistreated, every person how you're being done this and what. No. That's what Job is like now. Now you're not doing it to them, he's talking to God. And he sent us to God. Sometimes we don't just tell it to God, we tell it to others. You know, the people look at us and they They're like, let me do the same. Now, let me ask you this. Now, let me be honest. Now, don't answer me out loud. Just think about this here. Right? You know someone that whenever you talk to them, you say, how are you doing? And they're like, oh. And they start telling all the problems of life. You know someone like that? Huh? You just want to be polite and say hello. And 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes later, you're there saying, okay. And you're like trying to back away because you got to go somewhere. you got to do something. And they're telling you all the problems of life. How all the world is terrible. How everyone is wicked. And you're just like, you just said hello. <laughs> you know. That doesn't have to happen too many times. <clears throat> you read them a few times, you're always like, and pretty soon, you're going to be coming down, you see them. <laughs> what do you mean? It's like you try to avoid them. Sometimes people self-isolate. Sometimes people are just like, uh -uh, I don't want to be around them. Okay? So this self-pity leads to loneliness. Get over yourself. Grow up. All right? Now, all of us have been there. I'm speaking to myself too. I've been there, you've been there, we've all been there at some point. But we shouldn't remain there. Get over it, get right with God and love. Now, self pity leads to loneliness, but also can lead to wrong actions, to wrong decisions. Romans 6, verse 16 says, Knowing God that to whom the you yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. You know, we never hear about Jonah serving God after this time. Is there anywhere in the Bible? <coughs> is there anywhere you know of where after this time you see Jonah serving God? 
Just like the end for him. Then it was mentioned. Well, this is how the ministry is made out of one. May God, this is how you can do with me, may I not. And sometimes you get a wrong outlook on things, which leads to wrong actions. It's like he became a servant of disobedience and death. And he's even wishing God to stay my life. And you never hear about the life of Joel and his son. Now I hope you want to serve God, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But with this attitude here, then he did nothing the rest of his life. And as I share the story with others over the last few weeks, there's another thing that I noticed. You don't hear about any temples or any synagogues or any churches or anything when it's tight and started to work. You don't hear about Jonah saying, hey, we need to get together and let me teach you guys the word of God. Let me teach you what God has said. You don't see that. Anybody there? It's not there. There's no discipleship. There's no mentoring. There's nothing. And just a few generations later, a short time later, God did destroy the city of God. It's just like Jonah never been there. That's why it's important to have churches. That's why it's important to fulfill the Great Commission. Not just to lead people to Christ and drop them, but they get saved, they get baptized, we teach them the word of God, so now they get saved, their children get saved, their grandchildren get saved, their great-grandchildren, and so on until Jesus Christ comes back. And so we see future generations of people being saved and added to a church. But John did nothing. And so his impact was for a time, but then it was wrong. Now, we see that first prison that I was mentioned here, the prison of self pity What about the prison of self-righteousness? John chapter 4, verse 5. Now, see, some people think they're saved by their own righteousness. And then other people who are saved become self-righteous, which means they feel like they're better than everyone else. Now, John chapter 4, verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there gave him a booth and sat under it in the shade, shadow, to might see what would become in the city. Jonah felt like he knew what was best. I mean, Jonah even knows more than God knows how. I mean, Jonah is even more righteous than God now because God needed to destroy the city. Now, I know what you want, but listen to what I think you should do. I mean, it's like, how do you know? That's not how it should be. John chapter 4, verse 2. Look back to verse 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I have fled before into Tarshish, for I know that thou art a gracious God, a merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentance the evil. Now, notice it said, God repentance in the world of evil. You say, God repent. To repent means to turn and try to change your mind. So God said, I'll destroy them unless they repent. And so John and those that they repent, God will turn away from destroying them. That's what it's meaning here. Verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take that and see to thee my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. See, God, I knew this was going to happen. I knew you were going to change your mind. That's why I said no. That's why I went the other way, because I knew what you were going to do. Is that how we're supposed to be thought? No. That's not how we're supposed to be. Okay. Again, we see nothing has really changed in the life of Job. His life is still the same as the beginning of the story. He still not want the people of Nineveh to go unpunished. He don't want that. Again, we see Jonah all by himself. He is too good to associate with those people. And he's hoping that maybe God will still destroy them. He still hates the people. He still looks down upon those people. He still wants God to destroy those people. So he disassociates himself from them. He goes away from them. He goes outside of the city, 
and as a citadel hope that you come to see. You know, there's people that way still today. The same. There's people who may not like you, or maybe there's someone you don't like. And maybe you're hoping God will destroy them. Maybe you think this situation I'm in, what is going on, they deserve to be punished. Are you ready to God? Is vengeance now yours, or does vengeance belong to the I, I talked to a man several years ago. This is uh, six, seven, eight years ago. And I told this man, I said, I'm sorry to see that you're so angry. And I said, be careful because that anger can lead to bitterness. I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. But, huh. I said, no, hold on. I said, be careful about anger and bitterness. Because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will pay. This guy who looks at this side is on mine. He said, vengeance belongs to God. But I am the hand that God is going to use to bring it. No, you're not leaving it with God. Okay? No, you're not. That's kind of how Jonah is. God wants to show mercy to them. Jonah says, oh, I'm backing off. God, bring it on. God, destroy him. I mean, Jonah is supposed to be the instrument of mercy. He's the one who's supposed to come to share with them the love of God. And he wants them to be dead. And then when they repent, he's still hoping they'll be destroyed. That's not right. You know, Jonah knew what was right. He knew what was right. He preached to the people when they were saved. I'm sure that the people of Nineveh were rejoicing. Salvation brings destroyed. Now look at the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. You see, here's the thing though. Knowledge does not be destroyed. Just because you know something's right, doesn't mean you're going to do it. And doesn't mean that even if you do it, you're going to be happy now. <laughs> and by the way, whether you're happy about it or not, you're right. Okay? It's like someone said, you know, the Bible says, God loves the cheerful giver. And that's true, isn't it? I had one pastor who said, now God loves the cheerful giver, but you need to give whether you're cheerful or not. <laughs> okay, that's true. Um, you do right all the time. In Acts chapter 8, verse 5, the Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people of one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For us, the plain spirits, crying with loud voices, came out of many, though possessed of them. And many taken with uh, palsies that were laying with him. And there was great joy in that city. They gave heed to what he said. And when the preacher of God came, there was great joy that came to this. But jealousy leads to anger. It may be that Jonah is upset because he was punished, and now these people are going to forgive him. Was Jonah punished? He's in the belly of the way. Okay? He is running from God. Now, think about this. Just think about this one. The sea is turning up and down. The boat's like it's about to fall apart to break in pieces. And here's Jonah telling them, throw me into the sea and the water will come. Now, is Jonah wanting to save the life of those men? Or even at that point, was he willing to die rather than go to the turn back? And think about it. Maybe Jonah could have said, now I don't know, but maybe, maybe guys turn the boat around, hit back this way, you'll be fine. That's what I would have tried first. I'd rather be like, hey, turn the boat around, let's go to Nineveh, and it'll be okay. I, I don't want to go nowhere. I mean, I know how to swim, but with the sea the way it was, you're most likely going to die. Okay? Many people die in the oceans, in the sea, because of the storms that will come. But John is like, hey, you throw me overboard. Many people just want to die at that point, and start down. Or maybe he thought they got to swim to the land and hide in the room somewhere away from God. He still thought God was not going to turn back and he was right. And so here he is now. He's in the belly of the whale. He's barked out, hunched in the dry ground. 
He preaches the gospel. Now here, Jonah, the servant of God, Jonah, the preacher, Jonah, the man of God, was punished by God for not obeying him. The truth. Swallowed by the whale. I mean, he's in the absence, eating at his chin, in his stomach, in pain, and not knowing if he will live or die. So, here the man of God has been punished. And now he comes to know the city that deserves to be punished. The people who deserve to be punished with the enemies of God, the enemies of the people of God. They deserve to be punished. He was punished, and they're spared. No punishment is not fair. Huh. Sometimes it can be that way. Maybe that they felt that they deserved to be punished for other reasons also. The Bible says jealousy is a rage of a man. Therefore, will not spare the day of vengeance. He will not be writing your rags and then will be rest in the tent, though that never somebody gets. Jonah had personal experience of the mercy of God. But he feels that the people of Nineveh did not deserve a second chance. Yes, he was punished, but then also he was delivered, wasn't he? He didn't stay in the belly of the whale, he was given a second chance. Is that true? Yeah. God could have kept him in the belly of the whale, he could have died there. But he brought him up, and he brought him back to Nineveh, he brings him to that place, and he gives Jonah a second chance. Now, Jonah was smart this time. He said, I don't want to go back to the whale. Let me go preach. <laughs> okay. Uh, he learned a little lesson there. He went to preach. God gave him a second chance. This little but not deserve a second chance. Huh? Yes, they do. He so does not want to accept the fact that God is going to spare the sin. He did it, but not with a joyful heart that day. They were so fear of the Lord that motivated him. Also, we have the principle of selfishness or unthankfulness. John chapter 4, verse 6. And the Lord God prepared the Lord and made it to come up over Jonah that it might just shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So John was exceeding glad of him. He's glad of him. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared the heaven and the east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he kept. It's actually one of the problems. He lost it. And he wished himself to die. He, he was he was fake. He was weak. And said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the poor? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Can you imagine being in that place in your life? When you're so angry, when you're so upset, when you're so bitter. When you're so jealous that God is helping them, but it's not helping me in the way I want. But it's doing this for them, but about me. That jealousy, that self-pity, that self-righteousness. Just as God has his mercy on Nineveh, has shown mercy on Nineveh, God now had mercy on Jonah to carry the child. So God had mercy on Jonah on Nineveh. Now here's Jonah and the heat, God prepared the Lord to come out and to show him. Isn't that nice? Have you ever been on a very hot day that you get under the shade of a tree and it's hot? And it's like you feel refreshed, huh? You feel like life is coming back to you. I mean, especially here on the equator, you're living on That sun beats down on you sometimes, it feels like you're inside an oven, huh? You feel like you want to fall over, maybe faint. And then you get in the shade. And it's such a relief. It's a comfort. And so God raises up that man. Just as God has mercy on them, God had mercy now on Jonah. He slept there on the wall. He slept there under the feet. And God loved the Lord. And it says that Jonah was thankful for the Lord. But you know what it doesn't say? Now look back in that verse. Look there for a Look at this verse here. In verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a door and made it to come up over Jonah. But by the shadow of his head, to look at him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the Lord and thanked God for him. Does it ever say that Jonah thanked God for the Lord? Does it, I mean, who planted the seed? The Jonah? No. Who made it to grow? Was that Jonah? No. That was God. God did that for Jonah. And Jonah was glad for the Lord. He said, Oh, I'm so thankful this Lord is here. I'm so thankful for the shade. But you ever see him thanking God? No. He 
is not being thankful to God for it. Many times in life we get to where we expect certain things. Many try to fall like, oh, finally something's going my way. Finally something good for me, maybe. Not thank you, God, but like him. About that. You know? Sometimes we just ex we have certain expectations. Or things come and we just feel like maybe we deserve it. Then we're thankful for what we've received, but we're not thankful for the one who truly gave it to us. Who has provided that for us. We need to remember that God does not owe us anything. God owes me nothing. But sometimes we get that attitude between one another. I was talking to one of our men one day. And I told him, you know what I owe you? I owe you nothing. I don't owe you any money. I don't owe you a home to stay in. I don't owe you this. I don't owe you that. I don't. Because we're talking about lives and different things. And sometimes we have expectations. Now, as a Christian, there are certain things that we owe one another to love one another. And there are certain other things. Okay? And in the Bible, as a Christian, there are certain things we should be doing this. But sometimes people look at you and they start having certain expectations like, you owe me. People do that to government also. They start looking to government, but government owes you. Government doesn't owe you. Matter of fact, there's something you need to understand about government. Government, okay, it's like this. They say, government will come to you. Government comes and they say, oh, let me take my, my, my taxes from you. And oh, let me give you something back. They're giving back to you what they took from you. They get taxes and they say, let me help you. They help you. Where does government get their money? From people. Is that true? Through taxes. You pay taxes on food, you pay taxes on fuel, you pay taxes on everything. And every country is this way. I mean, that's how government works. But then people start thinking you owe them. Well, be careful for that attitude because if you want government to owe you, if you want government to give you all these free programs, if you want government to give you everything for free, where is government going to get it from? From you. <laughs> then they say, yes, I want to give you free education. I want to give you free medical. But it's going to be free this, free that. And so they raise the taxes. They do that in America. They do that in America. They do it everywhere. That's not money. That's not government. It's a right. Okay? And so it's a vicious cycle, you could say. <laughs> but this expectation, notice that government does not own me. God gets to be government. Government is from God. Okay? I don't have a wrong attitude towards government at all. But my, my point is this sometimes you really have a wrong attitude towards the government. Sometimes we have unrealistic expectations of our government. Government has its limitations. I have limitations. God has none. <laughs> okay. But we start getting this attitude of, you owe me. For what? Are you with That's a wrong attitude to have. Yes, we should care for one another. We should love one another. We should be there for one another. But we should also have a right attitude. Okay? Because we get this expectation, kind of like Jonah, we become unthankful. You get unthankful? Yeah. People don't like to be unthankful. Okay? We don't like that. Here it says Jonah was thankful for the poor, but it never says that he thanked God for it. We ought to be thankful. And many times we have that certain expectations. We feel like we deserve certain things. We need to remember that God does not owe us anything. I mean, we have sinned against a thrice holy God. We have sinned against God. I deserve to die and go to a place called hell. That's what I deserve. I'm glad God has not given me what I deserve. If I got what I deserve, I'd be dead and in hell. Because of my trespasses. But God in His mercy, God in His great love, say, that day as a 10 year old boy, I call upon the Lord. I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. I realize there's nothing in no one who can save me. I realize I don't deserve the grace of God. The Bible says, for my grace are you saved through faith. And that day I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't deserve it. 
wants them to be punished. He wants them to feel the same pain that he has felt. The same body, the same things. He wants them to suffer. Now also. And that's emotional. That's not how I am. Show that I will show mercy to you. And God will decide who will show mercy to God. It's not for our trust in the It's for us to follow the will of God. This is something we rejoice about when these people get saved. But in the end, John is oppressed, he's a beaten example. He's a slave by him. There are many people today who feel sorry for themselves. By the way, all of us have been there. Okay? I'm not just speaking about one person or any person in particular. All of us have been here in this place of all day. At some time or other. Alright? Maybe it's been a long day. Maybe it's recent. Maybe you're there now, or maybe you might be back in that place sometime in the future. Who are you for sorry for us? That self pity leads to resentment, that they say, don't get there. There are many that feel they're better than others, that self righteousness. I bet that they, they don't deserve this. They don't deserve it. They, no, I'm not, I don't know more than God. I'm not, no. We need to follow what God was saying. I'm not better than anyone. They get upset when others receive that mercy or any good thing. There's many who are unthankful. They feel like they deserve more. They feel like you don't. They get jealous when God is good to you and not to them. Why is this one? Why is that? Why? Why not me? Why am I here? Why am I suffering? Why? And they get resentment towards you. These emotions, as well as some others, do lead to anger. That it's bitterness. Let's not be like Job. Let's be thankful to God for His mercy that He's shown us, as well as His mercy He shows others. Don't be resentful when God blesses others, not you. You should rejoice with them. You should be glad that what God has done for them. Let us rejoice with those who rejoice. Let us be thankful for the goodness of God. Let us not fall into the devil's trap, which leads to anger, to being separated by our own self and prisoner. You're isolating yourself when you do this. Whether you intend to or not, whether you plan to or not, you're isolating yourself from others. You have self pity, you have anger, you have resentment, you have bitterness. It's like you're twisting, you're putting bars around yourself. It's not just that you're keeping yourself from being with others, you're keeping from others to be with you. Because others see that and they're like, no, thank you. I'm not going to be part of it. Bible says, don't go to that man, don't do certain things. The prison of self pity, the prison of self righteousness, of selfishness, of thankfulness. These things will separate us from the goodness of God, and these things will separate us from others as well. What do we need to do? We need to get right now. We need to confess those things and do for those things. We need to get those things right now. And you know what? When we get ourselves right with God, See, that, that's part of the challenge sometimes. Sometimes we're so busy trying to help others to get right with God that we don't realize that we're not right with God. When you get yourself right with God, when you're right with God, you know what happens? It's like you attract others to you who are right with God. Because others will see you and they'll see that righteousness of God. They'll see those works that you do. They'll see the life that you're living. They'll say, this is the kind of person I want to be around. Right. But if they see that ignorance, that bitterness, that resentment, that self-righteousness, there's other people who say, I, I, I don't hear on that. But when you get right with God, people will see that also. You know, I, I, told, I, I, I counsel a lot. People come to me and they'll tell me about problems and things and ask me what can I do. And I'll tell them what they need to do. But I also tell them this. It didn't take you one day to get into this problem. You've been, it's like you've been digging a hole. Uh, you've been digging a hole for a long time. And you've been digging down, you're down in this hole. It took you more than a day to get there. That might take you more than a day to get out there. But you keep going strong. You keep being faithful to God. And things will get better. Things will get good. Things will get where you want to be when you are playing. And by the way, all of us are always have a struggle to make sure we're right with God. 
There's sins in my life that I have to watch out for. You all have those who said the sins. I have things that I have to work on in my life. You have things you need to work on in your life. Each of us can have those sins we need to work on. I'm not better than anyone else. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We're the children of God. God loves each of us as a children. But some of us have some issues we might need to work on. So that we can be right with God. And we can be right with our fellow believers. Okay? There are some linear matters that we talked about before. We'll have things we need to work on. And these things I mentioned here tonight, all of us have struggled with them. And by the way, we'll probably struggle with them again. All of us, when we have some measure of success, are in kind of that self-righteousness. And they have to start pushing it back down. We have to make sure we humble ourselves before God, that we're right with God, that we're right with God. Now, when you're right with God, other people who are right with God will be attracted to you. But if you're not right with God, other people who are right with God will say, I don't want to suffer with you. Any more of this, any more of this. But this is, I mentioned here tonight, a things where some people in older city would say, that's not the kind of spirit I want. There's a thing that I've been seeing here online, a pastor from mine. And as we're talking about that, the challenge sometimes we have is there's people who are the same as us, they have the same doctrine, but they have a different type of spirit. The Bible talks about love, joy, peace, long suffering. And it's not always so evident some people, they have the same doctrine as we do, but not the same disposition or the same attitude. They talk about things differently, and instead of helping some people, they repel some people. Instead of being gracious, they're not. So, and, and there's a difference there. In many ways, they're the same as us, but in some ways, they're different. The doctrines are the same. But how they live their life, the things they say, how they do things, is different. And sometimes that difference drives people away. I don't want people to be driven away from our church. I want to put them church. And so sometimes people have those different dispositions that can cause people to be driven away. That's not something we desire. And so all of us, myself, me, you, those of us in the life tonight, all of us need to work on these things. Because you know what? Just when you think we defeated that evil enemy, just when you think we've gotten over that thing called anger, something happens in us. You're right back at it. <laughs> you know how long it takes to get angry? Not that long. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Every one of us has been there. I mean, you're feeling good, you have no problems, and somebody says something to you. Look at them, man.
or you can come by and drop it off at the office. We have an office here at the church. Um, the services are online, but we still our office. You can come by, drop that off at the office if you like. Uh, but as we pay for every area to come, and watch our services, and give our time offerings, and share our faith, and read our Bible praying, and ensure the gospel of others, let us continue to be faithful. And that all that faithfulness to God helps to keep us from those other problems. We're being faithful to God. So let's continue that. And also let's remember to be pray for one another. And that this uh, lockdown, this partial lockdown, a red or a red soon will be lifted. And so let's be pray for those things. Thank you.